Hi, thanks for coming. My name's Oliver Bacon. I'm an infectious disease doctor in San Francisco, and we're going to talk about extragenital testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia in men who have sex with men today. Uh, a couple things before we start. Um, some guys self-identify as gay. Some guys have sex either primarily or occasionally with other men. Uh, for the sake of saving words, I'm going to refer to those two groups collectively as men who have sex with men. Uh, the other thing is, what's this business of extragenital testing for STDs? Well, we have sex with lots of parts of our bodies. Um, some of them can get infected with gonorrhea and chlamydia, and it's important to test those sites. To give you a little bit of an overview, uh, these are some statistics from San Francisco uh, that show that MSM are actually disproportionately affected by STDs compared to their heterosexual brethren. Uh, and these are... STDs regardless of site. So, for example, compared to heterosexual men in San Francisco, uh, MSM have much higher rates of early syphilis, so primary or secondary uh, or early latent syphilis, 151 times more than heterosexual men. Um, they have higher risks of gonorrhea, almost 20 times the risk of gonorrhea as heterosexual men, and about seven to eight times the risk of chlamydia versus heterosexual men. So this is a real problem and a, a population that really needs to be uh, screened. What about gonorrhea and chlamydia specifically at extragenital sites outside the uh, urogenital tract, and really specifically in the oropharynx and in the rectum. So uh, these are some slides of rates of uh, rectal and uh, pharyngeal gonorrhea and chlamydia in MSM in San Francisco from about 2007 to the end of 2011. And 2011 is the last year for which we have complete data. So you can see for both diseases, gonorrhea and chlamydia, and at both sites, rectal uh, and uh, pharyngeal, uh, the rates have been increasing over time, uh, with the possible exception of oropharyngeal chlamydia. And I'll say that having seen the 2012 preliminary data, these rates are continuing to increase. So what are the two organisms that we're interested in? One is chlamydia trachomatis. It's an intracellular bacterium. Uh, it affects the cells that line uh, many anatomic spaces, including the urethra and the rectum and the oropharynx. Um, it's the most common bacterial STD. It predominantly affects uh, adolescents and young adults, or the, the rates are highest in adolescents and young adults. And it can cause a range of clinical symptoms from asymptomatic infection to very tissue destructive uh, diseases of the upper genital tract, upper reproductive tract in women that can possibly lead to uh, PID, infertility, and uh, uh, ectopic pregnancies, as well as very destructive uh, scarring lesions in the rectum. Um, what's the current state of treatment for chlamydia? It's actually very good. It hasn't changed in a long time. These are the current CDC guidelines for chlamydia treatment. It involves using a single drug, either a gram of azithromycin once orally or doxycycline twice a day for seven days. Uh, the treatment regimens in pregnant women are quite similar, except that you would use amoxicillin three times a day for seven days instead of doxy, because we don't like to give doxycycline or other tetracyclines to pregnant women. And pregnant women also need a test of cure uh, three or four weeks after their uh, treatment. This is the other bug, Neisseria gonorrhea. It's a gram-negative diplococcus. It's the second most common bacterial STD. It also causes actually essentially the same range of clinical syndromes as chlamydia. It can also cause disseminated gonococcal disease, which is a febrile systemic illness. It can also be asymptomatic, particularly in the rectum and in the oropharynx. Um, and one crucial point about gonorrhea is that it has evolved antibiotic resistance uh, since penicillin was first shown to kill it in the middle of the last century. So these are the current uh, CDC treatment recommendations for uncomplicated gonococcal infections. And uh, you'll notice that it, it, unlike chlamydia, treatment for gonorrhea requires nowadays two drugs, uh, where in the past we used to use one. The two drugs are a backbone of intramuscular ceftriaxone, 250 milligrams once intramuscularly, plus a second drug. And that second drug can either be azithromycin, one gram orally once, or doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. And the preferred drug is, is azithromycin for two reasons. It's one dose once, and it probably has more effect uh, against gonorrhea than doxycycline does. 
So the reason two drugs are now recommended against uncomplicated gonococcal infections is that uh, gonorrhea has evolved increasing amounts of drug resistance uh, since it was first cured by penicillin in the middle of the last century. Whereas gonorrhea was once universally susceptible to penicillin, it has evolved resistance to penicillin, it's evolved resistance to tetracycline, it's evolved resistance to quinolones, such as ciprofloxacin, uh, and it is starting to evolve resistance to the last fully active class of drugs, which are the extended spectrum uh, uh, cephalosporins. There is now some cefixime uh, resistant uh, gonorrhea, and cefixime was an oral uh, late generation cephalosporin that used to be universally active against gonorrhea. Uh, and so really the last uh, drug that we commonly use to treat gonorrhea that's reliably active is intramuscular ceftriaxone. So let's meet Jeremy. Uh, Jeremy is a 24-year-old man who has sex with men. He's here for STD screening. He has no symptoms. Uh, he has had about five male partners in the last six months. He has insertive and receptive oral and anal sex. Uh, he has some anonymous partners. Um, he's otherwise in good health. So the questions are, what kind of testing does Jeremy need and how often does he need it? So this is basically what the CDC recommends uh, for STD testing in MSM. It recommends urine, rectal, and pharyngeal gonorrhea testing and urine and rectal chlamydia testing using nucleic acid amplification tests uh, in sexually active MSM with possible exposures at those sites. In San Francisco, we add to that. We actually do oropharyngeal chlamydia testing as well because we've found uh, that uh, men in San Francisco who report insertive oral sex, meaning they receive fellatio, have acquired chlamydia through that route. <clears throat> um, it's also probable that if, if resources are limited in your site, you might consider omitting uh, urine tests for asymptomatic MSM and focusing on rectal and pharyngeal testing. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and it's also really important, as we'll talk about, to advocate that your local laboratory, if it isn't already doing so, be certified to perform nucleic acid amplification testing for uh, specimens gathered in the rectum and the oropharynx. Okay, so how common are chlamydia and gonorrhea infections among MSM seeking STD testing at the various sites that we test for? So um, these are data from San Francisco looking at where MSM uh, presenting for STD testing, whether they're asymptomatic or symptomatic, actually have their disease. Uh, so just to orient you to the slide, um, we have chlamydia on the left, gonorrhea on the right. Uh, blue is urinary infections, green is rectal infections, and purple uh, represents pharyngeal infections. And you can see that starting with chlamydia, about 5.5% had urinary chlamydia, 8.8% had rectal chlamydia, and 1.3% had oropharyngeal chlamydia. Looking at gonorrhea on the right, 6.6% had urinary uh, gonorrhea, 7.5% had rectal gonorrhea, and 94 had oropharyngeal gonorrhea. So uh, in almost all cases, they actually have more, uh, certainly more gonorrhea outside the urinary tract than in, uh, and in the case of chlamydia, more rectal chlamydia than urinary chlamydia. Okay, this slide should convince you that if you're not already testing uh, your MSM for uh, rectal STDs, you should. Um, because this slide shows that most cases of rectal gonorrhea and chlamydia are actually asymptomatic. Uh, so asymptomatic infections here are represented in blue. Symptomatic infections are represented in red. Looking at the top of the graph, these are rectal infections, 85% of rectal infections, whether chlamydia or gonorrhea, were actually asymptomatic. Okay, so if you only tested people who had symptoms, you would miss the vast majority of people who had disease at that site. Looking at uh, urethral infections below, um, the majority of infections uh, were symptomatic or outlined in red. Um, there's still a fair number of asymptomatic urethral chlamydia infections, but again, the majority are symptomatic. Okay, so getting to that point, how many infections would you miss if you just tested people's urine? You would miss a lot. You would miss 77% of chlamydia infections, and you would miss 95% of gonorrhea infections. So clearly, testing outside the urethra, outside the urine, is extremely important to pick these infections up. 
Okay, so let's say you want to set up your testing program, but you have limited funds, and you can't have everything. You can't test at all three sites. What testing should you do? So this slide uh, is a thought experiment. Two conditions were applied. On the left, a testing program that only tested urine. And on the right, a testing program that tested only rectal and pharyngeal sites. Captured infections or detected infections are represented in green, and missed infections are represented in orange. So on the left, if your testing program for asymptomatic MSM only screened for urine, you would miss the vast majority of gonorrhea and uh, chlamydia infections. On the right, if you only screened the rectum and the pharynx, you would detect the majority of infections, over 91%. So this suggests, depending a little bit on the prevalence of uh, the site of disease in your community, that a screening program that looks only at rectal and pharyngeal, looks only for rectal and pharyngeal infections in MSM, is actually more cost-effective. So we need to talk a little bit about testing technology, why the CDC recommends nucleic acid amplification testing over culture. Um, this is a comparative study uh, <clears throat> that looked at about 1,000 MSM presenting for uh, STD testing, and it compared the results of testing them with traditional culture versus using nucleic acid amplification tests. And as you can see, uh, going from left to right, rectal gonorrhea, rectal chlamydia, pharyngeal gonorrhea, pharyngeal chlamydia, culture represented in blue, NAT testing represented in red, in every, for both diseases at both sites, NAT testing detected a significantly higher number of infections than traditional culture did. The kicker is that nucleic acid amplification testing was designed and FDA licensed for testing at urogenital sites only. Um, so you can't just, as any particular lab, go out, buy a bunch of test kits uh, and use them wherever you want. Uh, the tests were designed with certain sites in mind. However, we just, as we've just seen, the tests are actually extremely good at detecting gonorrhea and chlamydia in the rectum and in the oropharynx. So what you can do is, as a lab, you can demonstrate using standardized specimens that your rate of uh, detection of gonorrhea and chlamydia using this technology is perfectly adequate. And once you've demonstrated that, uh, you as a lab are allowed to use these tests outside of the urogenital tract. So I would strongly advise you to advocate for your lab, if it's not already doing so, to uh, do the proper uh, validation studies to be allowed to use NAT testing for extra urogenital sites. Okay, so back to Jeremy. Five male partners in the last six months, uh, both insertive and receptive oral and anal sex, um, no symptoms. So we know, A, we're going to test him today in his urine. We're going to do a swab uh, of his rectum and a swab of his oropharynx. And we're going to send that for nucleic acid amplification testing. That's pretty straightforward. When should he come back for his next test? Okay, so these are based largely on the CDC recommendations for STD testing in MSM. And they basically say if they're HIV negative, MSM should be tested annually for HIV and syphilis, and they should get annual urethral and rectal testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia and pharyngeal gonorrhea screening if they have oral sex. At City Clinic, we follow these guidelines, and we add pharyngeal chlamydia NAT testing as well. Now, if they're at higher risk for infection, and that includes multiple partners, anonymous partners, alcohol or substance use, they should probably be screened more often, every three to six months. So as a last word, most MSM patients I've met are actually really interested in learning about this stuff. And when you tell them why you're testing at multiple sites, uh, they're, they're, they're interested and they want to know. Uh, and they want to know why. <clears throat> so uh, I think it's really important to use your patient visits uh, as a way to educate your patients to be good ambassadors of sexual health and STD treatment and control to their friends, their social networks, their sexual networks. So you want all your patients to be good Hillary Clintons, go out and tell the world about extragenital STD testing. That's it. Thanks a lot.